Hi guys, it's Debbie. While we're all hyped up about celebrating the triumphs and masterpieces in cinema as the year wraps up, let's not forget the other side of the coin, the absolute dumpster fire that torched our retinas this year. But before we dive into that fire abyss, can we give a round of applause to ChatGPT for churning out screenplay after screenplay this year? What a trooper! Anyway, as every year, you know the drill. If we ventured into the darkest corners of the of the lowest budget B-movies, we'd find some real tragedies. But the movies I'll be talking about today are the big leagues, big productions that completely disappointed us. And of course, I want to know what you hated most this year, so make sure to leave a comment down below. So, kicking off, at number 10, still lingering in the realm of maybe not throwing up, is Fool's Paradise, a comedy that everybody was excited about because of the intriguing premise, the star-studded cast. However, that excitement quickly vanished once viewers got a glimpse of the hot mess it turned out to be. The plot follows a man discharged from a mental hospital, he doesn't really have a direction in life and refuses to speak, but just happens to be a spitting image of some famous actor. And so, instant celebrity status, in, in, an interesting premise, right? Especially with such a cast. But no, the potential was squandered, thrown into the trash. They aimed for a smart, darkly funny jab at the film biz but fell into a pool of stale, run-of-the-mill slapstick gags. Say goodbye to any hopes of clever humour and brace yourself for a ride through the depths of bland, budget-friendly cheesiness. Plot goal? No, this film is just stumbled from one forgettable joke to the next while constantly trying to sell itself to us as the best self-ironic movie. Oh, see her? The one who looks like a model? Don't look. She's actually a prostitute. But don't worry, things can get worse. Next up, we have A Tourist Guide to Love. And let me tell you, watch this was quite the ordeal, even for somebody who, like me, revels in, a guilt in the guilty pleasure of bad romances like Twilight. Rumor Online has it that this film could actually be more of a hidden Vietnam travel ad than an actual movie. I don't know whether the Vietnam Tourism Board would actually be onto something like that, but I can see why people would think that way. It's about this really bland woman who gets dumped and somehow ends up in Vietnam, going undercover on a tourism trip for a job in the travel industry. She meets this tour guide and, shocker, they fall in love amidst some of the most mind-numbing conversations ever. And let's not forget her cover story, which makes absolutely no sense. But while all this nonsense is going on, the movie throws in these breathtaking landscapes that scream advertisement. Honestly, the only reason I stuck around through this tragedy till the end was for those beautiful views. What did you wish for? I can't tell you or it won't come true. Next up, we have The Exorcist Believer, a film which started off with a glimmer of hope. I mean, for the first 20-30 minutes, I actually thought people had just been a little too harsh on this film. Then the rest of the film hit, and I understood. This film attempts to revive the iconic Exorcist franchise, one of the most popular horror sagas of all time. They even roped in some of the OG actors. But when you're playing in the big leagues, you can't just dish out the most mundane, snooze-inducing exorcism story. At this point, there are so many exorcism films out there that if you're the OG exorcism saga, you have to bring something fresh to the table. Instead, it fell into boring, predictable discussions about demons and gods. I mean, even The Pope's Exorcist, which is far from being a good film, was still a better exorcism story released this year. The characters were so boring and emotionless that one of the fathers just blankly stares into into nothing for the whole film, even when his daughter's screaming bloody murder at him. Baby, you've been gone three days. I was hoping the super religious couple would have given an interesting twist to the story, but we only had maybe a couple of minutes of uh, fanatic chit-chat. It was a bit of a waste. This film was an absolute facepalm for the saga. And the cherry on the top, they're planning more of these disasters. Apparently, this train wreck was just the kickoff for a whole new reboot saga. Next in line, we have Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon, which I refuse to call by its full name, which is um, Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Yes, because there's going to be a second part in 2024. Now, I'm not part of the Zack Snyder haters. I know he has a great deal of those. I'm quite fond of his works, cliches and all, but this time I just couldn't stand the movie. And for being marketed as an epic action sci-fi Star Wars level story, I could barely keep my eyes open. And for how much they don't want us to associate it to a Star Wars knockoff, 
It just is. The story is set in a fictional galaxy in which a group of rebel warriors join forces to take down the evil military overlords. But instead of creating diverse, compelling worlds with rebels from every nook and cranny, it's a jumbled patchwork of places, aesthetics, storylines, flashbites, side quests, and names. So many names. The film throws everything at you, hoping you'll buy it as a deep, world building skill. I genuinely think Zack Snyder wanted this to be the new Star Wars or Dune, this epic sci-fi story people would be so intrigued into to the point of wanting spin-offs and, and series about background characters and stories and worlds that are mentioned, but nobody really cares. We're gonna have to fight. But climbing the ladder of cinematic disasters, behold, Beautiful Disaster, a film which might have saved itself if somebody had the courage to call this a parody. But no, except for a few ironic references to other bad rom-coms, it's dead serious. This film starts terribly and I don't know how, but it manages to get worse every change of scene. <laughs> Brace yourself for the utterly unrealistic saga of a cutesy college girl and a tough bad boy who's apparently a boxing extraordinaire because you know that's never been done before. Prepare for a wild roller coaster of coincidences that somehow magically land our protagonists in bed together, obviously falling in love. It's a masterpiece of poor writing, forced coincidences with no chemistry between the characters. The love story unfolds in the most unrealistic manner possible. She attends one of his fights, gets blood splattered in her face, she starts to feel attracted to him. Fast forward a couple of days, they're already in bed together with one of the most cringeworthy sexual misunderstandings, which might have made me laugh when I was 13. By the way, I still don't understand why his penis was making like squeaky dog toy noises. And remember, if the roles were inversed, this film would have been absolutely cancelled from the face of Earth. And as I was mentioning earlier, I'm not one to shy away from a dumb rom-com, but this takes the cake for being impressively bad. Travis, you invaded my privacy and then you turned around and ghosted me? Goodbye. All right, now shifting gears, into action territory, we have Expendables 4. Now, the Expendables idea is to gather every action superstar under the sun and throw them into the craziest missions known to humanity. I actually watched the Lorna's documentary earlier this year in which he explained how he got um, the idea for this saga. Apparently, he felt his days as an action star were numbered because of his more mature age. Then he went to a sort of um, revive, rock revival concert and he realised people still dig the classics. Anyway, I digress. My point is the premise of the franchise isn't bad. The problem with this fourth chapter, it's a complete train wreck. The plot, non-existent. It's a hot mess patched up with Megan Fox's random sex scenes trying to cover up the non-stop plot holes. And don't get me started on the CGI. It was, it was, it was literally embarrassing. I think most of the budget must have gone to, to pay the big names, but really the only person still putting in some good action chops was Jason Statham. Mark my words, if they dare roll out another Expendables chapter, cinemas might as well echo with emptiness. I got this situation where I need your help. But now behold, another unnecessary addition to Saga that nobody asked for, Spy Kids Armageddon. Seriously, did we really need a fifth chapter? The Spy Kids movies were never award-winning masterpieces. They're all about that cheesy, family-friendly action everyone could get a kick out of, except for those occasional nightmare-inducing scenes. But now we're graced with this fifth instalment, which honestly seems made solely for the iPad generation. The effects and production design are so abysmal, it's like they're trying to outage the first movie from 22 years ago. Remember the vibrant, quirky vibes from the early Spy Kids movies? Well, kiss those goodbye. Here it's all about dreary, monotonous fighting within the mind-numbing grey walls of their house. Oh, but wait, they do move out eventually. Cue the coolest gadgets because apparently this film's sole purpose is to hook those screen-addicted kids with an overload of tech. And let's talk relationships for a moment. Remember how cheesy but believable the relationship between uh, Carlo Gugino and Antonio Banderas was in, in the first films? Now we have Gina Rodriguez and Zachary Levy who seem to be like school kids trying to act out as a couple at a school play. Actually, I was quite generous with director Robert Rodriguez this year, sparing his other 2023 film, Hypnotic, from this list. Where is she? Okay guys, brace yourselves because we have now hit 
the bronze medal of cinematic disasters with The Ritual Killer, a film which is cringeworthy just for existing. Mum, can we have seven? We have seven at home. That is the vibe here. It's as if the marketing team desperately hoped people would mistake Morgan Freeman's appearance as a sign of another gritty crime thriller like Seven. Spoiler alert, it's not. Sure, there's crime, uh, there's a killer, and there's Morgan Freeman. Mystery, non-existent, we're handed the killer on a silver platter right from the start. Morgan Freeman is sort of just a token uh, stand in there. Apparently he's the only African studies professor in the whole world who can crack this case. He's completely underutilized in the plot. I think this is the kind of movie De Niro was talking about when he said you get to a point where you just take on some roles just to pay things like divorces. But here comes the second place, the silver medalist, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Admit it guys, we saw this train wreck coming from a mile away. I mean a murderous Winnie the Pooh at First it sounds hilarious and intriguing, but then uh, when it, the delivery, no. Let's entertain the notion that this could somehow be interesting. The problem is the production quality plummets straight into the abyss of the cheap production quality of kids shows from the early 2000s. We're talking cardboard trees. If you're Italian, think Millevisione. Now let's chat about gore. Sure. The gory scenes are gory, <laughs> nothing wrong there. But here's the kicker, randomly sawing, stabbing and hacking doesn't quite make for a compelling plot. That's what I was trying to say when talking about Five Nights at Freddy's. Sure, when the animatronics attacked it was scary, but if the remaining two hours of people talking to each other as if they're reading a teleprompter, it's just not going to work. This film is a puzzling mix between trying to conjure up a real murderous Winnie and guys in rubber masks. You had one job, but at the very first place, the king of bad movies is the one, the only, Ghosted. I could write a whole thesis on how much I hate this film, but I'll stick to the highlights. Even just calling this a film is a stretch. For me, it's a glorified Apple ad. Yes, I get it's an Apple TV movie, so of course the characters wouldn't be caught dead with a Samsung. But the entire plot, if you can call it that, basically revolves around all these Apple gadgets, especially those air tags, which are the focus of the film. But even if you somehow manage to ignore the blatant product placement, the rest is an absolute disaster. Brace yourself for a story so mind-numbingly boring, predictable and riddled with plot holes. And don't get me started on Anna de Armas's awful wig. That deserves a, a Razia world in its own. Let's talk characters. Chris Evans, the end of the film, he can't even do a flight of steps without his breathalyzer. But let's just forget that because you know, for the rest of the film, because be, because action. Seriously, why was this film even greenlit? At this point, it would have been a gift if someone just labelled it as a, as a parody or an ad. I mean, most of the time, it felt like the actors weren't even in the same time zone, let alone on set together. It's like they were patched in, green screened or somehow put together. But the film bombards you with so many cameos to try to distract you from how terrible the whole thing truly is. Is that a joke? But with that, Thankfully, we have reached the end of the worst films of the year, and now I want to know what you hated the most this year. So make sure to leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought about these titles I spoke about today. I want to know everything. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.